watching the video sermon podcast of First Baptist Church of Marble Falls, Texas. For almost 130 years, FBCMF has served Marble Falls and the Greater Highland Lakes area faithfully through children's programs, youth activities, and adult discipleship. We invite you to join us each and every Sunday morning at 9 and 10.30 a.m. for deep fellowship, rich worship, and a spirit-filled message. For those who find themselves unable to attend on a Sunday morning, we stream those services. Simply visit fbcmf.live during either of our service times to view it. Never miss an archived sermon by subscribing to this podcast on YouTube by visiting youtube.com forward slash fbcmftube. And to learn more about our church or to listen to an audio-only version of this and other sermons, please visit us online at fbcmf.org. Next week, we are beginning Missions Month, and I'm excited about it. Every uh, year during November, we focus on um, the mission work that our community has going on locally. We focus on it statewide, globally, and we talk about everything that the Lord is doing in um, social justice and in evangelism throughout our whole world. And we hear uh, stories, and we set up booths, and we, we engage missionally, and I'm excited about out uh, next week. The, the theme for next week is love thy neighbor, and uh, that's really appropriate considering everything that we've been dealing with for the past two weeks. And what I was going to do when we planned out and I thought through these sermons for the year is this morning I knew that I was going to be finished with the games that we played last week, and I was going to begin and introduce love thy neighbor and introduce the missions month. Um, but as uh, things would happen, um, considering our recent struggle in our community to overcome the floods of 2018, what I would rather talk about is the passage that um, was read a moment ago, and that is how Jesus overcomes and calms the storm. Now, if, if anyone is listening right now on the internet and you live a long ways away and you don't live in our area, when I say that Uh, we are struggling to overcome the floods of 2018, I don't mean that symbolically. Um, I mean it very, very literally that that in Burnett and Llano County, over 300 people have lost their homes. And, uh, and, and, And we have been through a lot as a community. Those of you who work in the schools, the children show up and maybe many, many of them are without a lot of supplies, are without their homes, and you're beginning in the school districts to begin to, to, to help give them amount of security and safety in their lives. Um, what we're dealing with is no small thing. Our church is pulled together with churches all throughout our community. And in, in, in Burnett County alone, we had over 100 churches uh, that were flooded out. And, and I'm very thankful that, that with the help of other churches and people all throughout our community, y'all, we have helped clean out all 100 plus homes. Um, it, it was a huge, huge feat and, uh, and, and, and labor intensive. Um, it, it was crazy for the past two weeks. Uh, for, did y'all hear this story that there was one man who on last Tuesday, the, tu- the Tuesday that it all happened, that he was trying to save his jet ski. Did y'all see this in the news? He's trying to save his jet ski and the waters are rising so fast that it, it sucked him out and, and it sucked him down the river and he was floating down with all of the debris, all of the boats and, and docks and everything and he was washed over Max Starkey Dam. Did y'all see that? He was washed over Max Starkey Dam and he was washed 18 miles down the road. They found that brother somewhere near Spicewood and and he lived. He lived. And and here's what I've been thinking about this this guy. If any of you know who he is, I'm desperate to meet him because he is a guy who stands in good with the Lord. And uh, I want to talk to him. For for some amazing reason, God has spared his life for something good, and I just want to be a part of it. And, uh, and, and I want to bring him in and have an interview and, and talk to him here. I talked with a guy from LCRA, 
a few days after it happened, and I was talking to him about all the boats and, and houses that were going over the dam, and, uh, and, and he said to me, but do you know the number one thing that went over, that washed out? And I said, what? And he goes, noodles. <laughs> Swimming pool noodles by the millions. He said, every child in Austin now has their own swimming pool noodle. <laughs> he said the whole river was full of them. When it comes to floods, when it comes to storms, we hear something uh, interesting. Um, the way that Matthew remembered a storm that he and the disciples encountered, this is what he remembered about it, that Jesus' presence, Jesus' power, helped them to understand both danger and loss in a very different way on this day. It transformed in how they thought about danger. It transformed how they thought about loss, that there was something about the power and the presence of Jesus. And, and, and I want to talk about this. Uh, and it's helpful. It's not just helpful, y'all, for what we're dealing with right now. But I think what, what we learn here in Matthew 8 is also helpful in light of the escalation of natural disasters in our nation and throughout our world. If our planet is changing and there are going to be more intense superstorms that they're not even going to have categories for them with our current system, that they're going to have to start calling them category six and category seven kinds of hurricanes, and that there's going to be more of these super kinds of storms with greater winds and greater rain, greater amounts of, of, of all of it. If that's the truth, then, then Jesus' presence and Jesus' power is exceedingly relevant for right now and for our future in dealing with all of the climate issues and in dealing with issues throughout our world. It's also very helpful when we encounter this thing um, called um, uh, uh, caregiver fatigue. That, that the, I learned this, that the Texas Baptist men who go to all of these mud outs and go to all of these disasters, they have been deployed for 18 straight months, sending people out, working alongside of them. I, I'm nervous about this. Are y'all nervous about this? That something's going to happen to me and everybody's going to be too tired to help me because they've been working and working, trying to help so many. And, and, and because of that, th this idea that Jesus is able with his presence and power to speak into all of these things is really relevant. And so with that in mind, I want you to return to Matthew chapter eight. And I'm gonna read it with us and uh, look at verse 23. Matthew chapter eight, verse 23. This is what Trey um, read to us a moment ago. Matthew eight, verse 23. Here we go. Then he got into a boat, and his disciples followed him. That's going to be important here in just a second. The disciples followed him and got in the boat with him. Now, without warning, a ferocious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus is sleeping. The disciples went, and they woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to perish. And he replied, you of, of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up, he rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And the men were amazed, and they asked, what kind of a guy is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Okay. Let's break it down for just a second. I'd like to treat it in an expository kind of way and just march through this text and let the pieces of it begin to teach us. It ends very, very well. Even the winds and the waves obeyed him and everything was calm. But getting there, there are several steps that begin to happen. First thing is there is a storm and there is a prayer. Members of our church... And members of our community have felt a little bit lately like these disciples, and they may not have prayed these exact words, but I would wager that they prayed words very similar to them, um, uh, to the disciples' outcry that said, Lord, save us, we're perishing. 
And the word perishing is a strong word. It was appropriate when the disciples used it. They thought that they were going to die right then. But what word would you put in its place that represents how our community felt or maybe how all of you felt? Um, as you get into houses to try to help and you're just surrounded by so much stress and so many difficulties, what, what, what did y'all felt? If you were going to pray this, um, Lord, save us, and, and you were going to follow it up and say, we are, and you weren't going to say perishing, what, what, what would you say? How would you write it right here? Um, how about the word overwhelmed? Are y'all okay with that one right now? Let's go with that. Save us, Lord. We are overwhelmed. Here's why it fits with the actual text. And in the Sea of Galilee, it was notorious for storms that would just come up all of a sudden. And most of the fishing boats were about 14 feet long. And so imagine if you're in a relatively small boat in a huge, huge lake that's deep and dark. And the Bible says that the waters begin to come into the boat. The, um, uh, the, the New American Standard Version says that all of the water was covering the boat. But I like the way that the New Revised Standard Version says it the best. It says that the waters were about to swamp the boat. The waters were swamping the boat. It's a good Cajun interpretation swamping the boat. It's the idea that they could not bail out the water fast enough. They're trying to get it out, but waters are swamping it. The word swamping and the word overwhelming just go together. It's this idea that, that have you ever come home from work one day and, and your family said, well, how are you doing? And you say, I'm swamped. What you're saying is I'm overwhelmed. There's too much. It means that your environment has given you too much and you cannot handle everything your environment is giving to you, that the waters are coming into your boat, they're coming into your home, they're coming into your life, and you can't bail fast enough to get yourself out of this mess. It's overwhelming. Save me, Lord. I'm overwhelmed. And I think that's a good way to say it. And, and I can tell you this, it represents completely how I have felt. Being overwhelmed causes our brains to go into a thing um, called static brain. Have you heard this st static brain? When you can be so confused that when you feel overwhelmed, it sends you into a confused um, restless kind of place. Static brain where, where you can't organize your thoughts it, it, you, you know that you need to respond to something, but you can't make a very good plan, and your brain just feels like it's going, Psh, and you just can't think clearly because you're confused and because you're overwhelmed sometimes, and, uh, and you can't create a plan. At the beginning of a tragedy, like when you lose your whole home, um, you don't know where to begin. You, you, you look at everything, and it's just overwhelming, and you think, should I begin with the floor should I begin with the walls around me? Who do I call? Do, do I call my pastor? Do I call my insurance company? Well, what about FEMA? Where is FEMA? I've heard. I don't know a whole lot about FEMA, but I've heard that they help in times like this. Who do I call to get their help? What do I do? And, and, and here's what it's kind of like. It's kind of like you walk this way and then you turn around and walk the back. You, we can be so overwhelmed that we start to walk a little bit in circles. Because something happens to our brain and it's like we go into a static kind of place. Anytime we feel overwhelmed, we, we can go there. It, it, here's what it, it, it feels a little bit like. In the first 20 minutes of the movie Saving Private Ryan, there is a man who, who as they're attacking Omaha Beach, those of you who've seen it, you'll remember, there's a guy who's lost his arm. And bullets are just flying by and bombs are going. Most everybody else is hunkered down but there's one guy who's just walking and he's looking for his arm. He's looking for it and then he reaches down and he finds it and he just keeps walking and, and holding it up. It's, it's, he's walking in this state of shock and confusion. When we are all overwhelmed, there's a kind of confusion that can set in and we just start looking around for our arm again, trying to find something that will make us feel whole and something that will make us feel like we are together once again. 
Where, where, where are my pictures? Where is my insurance stuff? Where is everything? Where is, where is my life? And we start walking around in circles trying to find it. This is kind of what it's like. So I can understand this idea of being swamped, being overwhelmed. This is a human reality and so we cry out, help us or save us, Lord. We're overwhelmed. And, and you know what? That prayer oftentimes is just the best that we can do. As we worked in our neighborhoods, um, clearing out houses, we amassed pile after pile, huge piles of, of wreckage from, from people's homes and we sloshed through mildewy wet carpet and, and we put our fingers through sheetrock and we were able to pull off sheetrock from homes with our bare hands and try to get it all out. And, and, and in the end, then we looked at somebody's house and it didn't have any walls left. Um, it j just the frame of everything. And, uh, and then we looked at all of their things and it was all scattered around everywhere. And, and as I looked at, at it on several occasions, it, it seemed as if we really were overwhelmed or swamped by the waters. And so there is a legitimate parallel between the feeling and what the disciples were going through and what many people in our community have been through, their situation and ours. And, and so what the disciples started doing is, is they went to the one person, their best bet when they felt swamped and overwhelmed, their best bet was simply to go to Jesus Christ. And, and, and Psalm 46 said that our God is a God of refuge and strength and very present help in times of trouble. And so they go to Jesus Christ and they call on him. And they say, Lord, save us, we're perishing. And I find Jesus' reply odd. I mean, I, I, I've heard this before in, in many contexts of my life. I've heard it all of my life, but for the first time I read it in, in, in this most desperate of moments, and, and it strikes me as very, being very bizarre. Jesus says to them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? And it's the end of that statement that bothers me. Does that statement bother any of you? I, I don't like it. You of little faith, the King James Version says it in the familiar way, oh ye of little faith. Has anybody ever said that to you in a moment of crisis and you just wanted to hit them in the mouth? Today it's become almost a cliche, hasn't it? The people say it when they don't know what to say or even worse, some pious or holier than thou kind of a Christian offers it to you at a moment in your life and it makes you wonder if they have ever weathered a storm in their entire life. Is Jesus criticizing the apostles? They come to him with this prayer, save us, um, we're about to perish, and then he talks about their little faith as he beginning to criticize. I wonder what the disciples felt like when they heard that, if they had had a moment in the crisis and a moment to respond. I wonder if they would have said, little faith, little faith, Jesus, do you not see what's happening right here? Little faith, Jesus, we, we're, we're out here in this boat with you, aren't we? Verse 23, we got in the boat and followed you. We're following you. Little faith, we've left everything behind. We've left our, our family, our jobs. Um, the, the, the Jews were scared that they're going to start persecuting us and kicking us out of the uh, synagogue because we follow you. We've left behind our, 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 our friends, our family, our tradition. We've left behind everything. Little faith. There were a lot of people, Lord, who didn't follow you. Your own family decides not to follow you. You got a few people here who are giving in and, and, and listening to everything you say. We got in the boat with you. What do you mean, little faith? You have the audacity to tell us little faith? No, 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 no. I don't know. The, the Bible doesn't say how they felt, but I guess I'm just getting all riled up on their behalf. Because... 
What doesn't seem fair to me is that Jesus would tell them about their, their faith because if he would tell them, them that, then that means he'll tell us that. I guess that's what's bothering me so much because when Jesus tells them about their little faith, um, then probably he would turn to me and all of us and say, why are you so scared? Do you, not, do you have little faith as well? And so I read it over and over again, and, and, and it was bothering me at first. But y'all know what? The, the more that I read it and the more that I thought about it, these words that once bothered me, God began to help me to understand, and they moved to be very, very comforting words. And here is how it happens, and here's where we're going to come to the very end of the sermon. How does, O ye of little faith, in the middle of a storm in our life, move from bothering us to being a comfort? to us. I, I think here's how. When we read the words, O ye of little faith, I was reminded of something that is crucial to understand this passage. And here's what it is. A little faith is much better than no faith at all. A little faith is better than no faith at all. And here's why. Because even a little bit of faith apparently puts you in the boat with Jesus. Just a little bit of faith puts you there. And when, when you are in the boat with Jesus, you will have enough hope to make it through the moments that are overwhelming. He gives you the hope when you're being swamped with things, if you have a little bit of faith to be in the boat with him. The, 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 the spark of faith that, that, that we have, it doesn't have to be huge. You don't have to have every answer in the world. You don't have to be a mountain of strength and be able to, to, to give this, this perfect, eloquent kind of belief system and hold on to it. In, in, in your moments when you've let go of a lot of things, if you could just hold a spark of this little bit of faith, then what happens is Jesus is in the boat with you in your situation, and he is the only one then that has the power to calm and to help your storm. I think that whatever boat you might find yourself in, how, how much good can happen with a little bit of faith? These disciples, Jesus said, you don't have much faith, but what happened because of their faith? Everything began to be calmed after that. The disciples recognize it immediately. Jesus calms everything. Their little faith accomplished a lot. Jesus wakes up and he calms everything and then their faith grew even more. And, and they say, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? I, I encourage all of you to do one thing, one thing today, stay in the boat with Jesus. Don't abandon your faith and just give up. A little bit of faith will go a long, long way and if you hold on to that, it's important, and y'all, th th there are moments when many times that's all we can muster. We can't muster a great amount of faith. Sometimes we can just muster this amount, but even a little bit of faith will put you in the boat with Jesus. I don't know that he expects a whole lot more than for us to hold on to this. There's a great passage of scripture in Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 31, and all of the Israelites have been in exile for 70 years. And, and God is beginning to release them and restore them to hope. And, and this is what the prophet Isaiah says. But for those who will hope in the Lord, and the word hope is very similar to the word have faith, and it's similar to the word wait. For those that hope and for those that wait in the Lord, he will restore your strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles, they will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. A seminary professor reminded me, he said, you know, Ross, the real promise of that verse is not that you're always gonna feel like soaring with the eagles. And it's not even that you're always going to feel like running. He said, but the real promise of that verse is that when, when all you can do is walk, when all you can do is have a little little bit of faith, then God will help you to put one foot in front of the other so that you don't faint. And he said, until one day when God gives you the ability to run again, and then one day God gives you the ability to fly again. 
Y'all, isn't it great that you don't have to fly in order to be in the boat with Jesus? And you don't have to run to be in the boat with Jesus. Jesus wants you to be with him with just a little bit of faith if you can just walk. Be with him in that and then what happens is he begins to calm things down when you feel swamped and when you feel overwhelmed, not just symbolically, not just spiritually, but y'all, he can help in real tangible ways when literally, literally, our lives are, are damaged as well. Isn't that a good message for a changing world right now and all that we're dealing with? Matthew 8 is really powerful, isn't it? You've been watching the video sermon podcast of First Baptist Church of Marble Falls, Texas. Never miss an archived sermon or video posted to our YouTube channel by subscribing to it at youtube.com slash fbcmf2. For more information about our church and to hear an audio-only version of this sermon, please visit us online at fbcmf.org.